calling the Board of Directors meeting of Trinity Metro at 3.04 p.m. on April 15th. Uh, this meeting is called to order. The first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. And if Mr. Robertson will lead us in the pledge. And second order of business, there are some who have not taken the oath of office. And for those of you who have not taken the oath, um, Joel will give us the oath. Uh, so please rise if you have not taken the oath. Ms. Oh, yeah, so, uh, current board members, uh, every year you have to be sworn in, so. We did it last meeting. So you want to yeah. say it again? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. The people that weren't being here. nice by saying those who oh, haven't have taken the oath. Ah. <laughs> Not it was Isaac's idea to point that out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in bigger chunks than I did last time. So um, repeat after me. I state your name, do solemnly affirm that I will faithfully execute. The office and duties of the board of directors of the Fort Worth Transportation Authority of the state of Texas. The, <laughs> retry. <laughs> the office of the board of directors of the Fort Worth Transportation Authority of the state of Texas. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States And of this state, so help me God. Well done. Okay, we're going to have some uh, cone of silence for that last event. Uh, we have one uh, citizen comment card. Um, Ricky Carter, uh, would you like to speak, uh, Mr. Carter? Timer here for three minutes. Oh. So, Mr. Carter, please state your name and, and your address, Carter. and then you've got three minutes. All right, I was concerning about this plan. They're wanting to change the buses to the zip zone. I wrote and told them at the other hearings in the executive office, but that courtyard, Mariana, in the courtyard, uh, in the stockyards that has two and a half, three and a half million tourists a year. The manager told me they've, there's people there spending $60, $70 for a one-way taxi to the airport. And they don't know nothing about your text rail. They know nothing about your bus. The bus ticket, $5, would take them all the way to the airport. And you have your zip zone in that area not even going to the courtyard Marriott, where it's two blocks away outside of its boundaries. And I mean, if y'all interested in new revenue, I mean, that's one way to get about 2,500 a month, just out of that one motel. You, you have to get your sales rep to go in there, talk with the manager, if I'm right, you do the sale on a allotment of bus tickets for them to give as confirmations to their hotel guests and you got to have brochures in there as well as the a brochure of them which don't have schedule but the map of the zone right there in the stockyard especially and explaining that five dollars take you clear down in the, to the airport but the text rail goes right down into the terminal of the airport, you're right there. You, and they don't understand this. And T 
TMs trying to figure out how to get new revenue is why they're having this hearing today, right? And, well, you can start getting a new sales representative because <laughs> he's not doing that. You need to do this with all the stockyards, hotels, and let them, they're missing, misinformed to misinform on that. And you should have your zip zones outside 820 loop, bringing in people to use the bus lines and the train. Instead of doing away with the buses to replace them with zip zone, because what are you gonna do when they tell them the six person's gotta get dumped and stay behind with everybody else, you know? You're not gonna use no mini mover. Appreciate it, Mr. Carter. Thanks for coming down and making your comments. I believe that's all of the cards we have. Um, the uh, public hearing is closed. We'll go into the United Way presentation. Petra. Good afternoon, board members. I'm Deetra Whitmore, Vice President of Community Engagement. Before I begin, I want to welcome our two new board members. We're looking forward to working with you, and also congratulations on the swearing in. So Trinity Metro, we have been partnering with United Way for many, many years, and we've worked together to help provide the basic needs for people in the community, the human services. Um, there's so many people in our community that needs our help, so we've worked with, with United Way to do that. Trinity Metro held its spring campaign this year and successfully raised $24,715.75. Way to go, team. We could not have accomplished this without heartfelt donations of our employees and also a huge thank you to our executive leadership team for leading the way. I also want to thank our United Way committee members. Uh, the committee was led by Lenore Kimbrough. Committee, would you please stand to be recognized if you're here today? And at this time, we would like to present a check in the amount of $24,715.75 to United Way, Kentisha. I just want to uh, give a word of thanks to the Trinity Metro team for their generosity. Uh, we've been talking a lot about at the leadership level our values, our core values, and one of our core values is um, really uh, being, being there for our community and supporting our community. We, we don't do anything here alone. We do it with the support and participation of the people that we serve in our community. And this is one of the small ways that we can give back. And I, I just want to Thank everyone from the bottom of my heart for your generosity, uh, for giving something out of your own paycheck to help others. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I have the honor of serving on the Tarrant County United Way Board. 
So on behalf of my fellow, myself, my fellow board members, our CEO, Leah King, thank you so much to the Tyranny Metro family for all you do every day to help those in our community. Thanks, Tito. Appreciate it very much. Uh, increment helps. Uh, let's do it again next year, and I'm going to have to have 27 or 28,000, so I'm sorry. Um, the next item is the meeting minutes of the last meeting of March 18. Uh, I'll accept a motion to have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The first um, information item is uh, from Reed. <laughs> well, good afternoon, board members. I'm Reed Lanham, the vice president of rail here at Trinity Metro. And I'll give you a brief report on March for our rail performance. If you go to the next slide, please. We'll start off with uh, Texrail. Texrail had a great March. Uh, we talked about how January we dipped down a little bit. Uh, there were some weather events that kind of kept folks away from traveling. March was one of our strongest months ever without one of our special grapevine events that we'd all love so much. Uh, we, we usually see really strong ridership during our events, whether it's in Fort Worth, North Virgin Hills, or Grapevine. In March, we didn't really see the big special events, but our ridership was phenomenal. We were over 60,000 for the first time in a month without a special event which we think is a, another sign of growth, uh, progress, that we're really excited about. Uh, we also, our safety record at Texro is something that we are very serious about and something we focus on. Our transportation and signal departments both passed over 2,271 days injury-free. Our maintenance of way is at 1,341 days, which those are the gentlemen that take care of our track structure and the right-of-way for us. And then our maintenance of equipment, had, they're at 156 days. So again, a kudos to the team, uh, the commitment, the lack of complacency that they show every day, and the focus to their work. We're very proud of that. Uh, I will mention, since we're talking textile right now, I don't know if, uh, how many of you are aware of the derailment we had last week? We had a small, <laughs> small to large derailment at Fort Worth and Western. They had eight cars that came off of their track near our north side station. Two of those ended up on our main line. We received the call about 2.57 a.m. in the morning. We responded. We were down for about 31 hours. That was getting the cars re-railed. It had taken out one of our control signals at the location, and then it had shifted our main line 18 inches, the impact from the car. So our forces over the next 31 hours worked diligently to get us back up as quickly as possible. And a big thank you to Ron and his team, and specifically Vernon Porter. I want to I want to highlight Vernon. It was about 3:03 in the morning, if I remember correctly, when I'm making calls to people. And uh, I called him on the second ring. He picked up and went. Just his first response was, "Where do you need the bridge?" He had no <laughs> clue what was going on. He just saw my name and knew he needed to respond. So a big thank you to Vernon. Um, again, that, that was a big deal for us. Uh, we, we were able to safely and successfully get the railroad back up early Friday morning um, with as little impact to the customer as possible. But again, big kudos to the team. Uh, next slide, please. TRE, they continue to perform admirably as well. The, the on-time performance at TRE while lacking in the past, has consistently been above the mark month after month. And that's, that's due to the efforts of our team members out there, our contractor. It, it's the performance of TRE has increased dramatically. And we are seeing a rise in ridership. We had a total ridership of 108,650 in March on TRE, and that was up a little over one and a half percent. And for the year to date, we're over 45,000 passengers up on TRE. So again, we're gonna keep pushing that. A few key things to mention about TRE, we're, we're in talks, not in talks, we're in a deal with Siemens to purchase five new Siemens Charger locomotives. I'm actually going out to Sacramento next week to see those and to, to tour the facility and work a little closer with their folks. So I'm looking forward to that. And we know that 
the, the region, our customers, and especially our staff are looking forward to getting these new locomotives in as soon as we can. Uh, we also opened the Trinity Lake Station. We had the grand opening a couple of weeks ago. That's been a huge hit with the public. Um, it's a beautiful looking station and it's already gaining in, you know, uh, we've got people out there counting the cars. I can get you those numbers, but we're seeing them go up week after week. So again, if you have any questions, that's my report for this month. I have a completely uh, random question, but how do they deliver those locomotives? Do they rail them here from? That's correct, yeah. That's cool. That's we, got, we need pictures of that. We need to do a whole media campaign of following it on the map as it comes here. For, for those of us that were here when Texrail was being built, our first locomotive was shipped in by truck. And there was a, a slight issue with the close clearance on an overpass on its way here. Might have caused a ding or two. Uh, so since then, we've had them shipped by rail. Yeah, That's so, awesome. Yeah. So when... That's something we're looking at now very closely. We're, uh, we're in talks with Stadler for the purchase of four new DMUs. And uh, once we're, we're taking looks at schedules now and what the additional infrastructure that we'll need, and hopefully soon we'll be able to, to have a better idea of what exactly it's gonna take to increase those headways um, with the additional infrastructure and equipment and then the extension as well factored in. Well, I, I know the goal has been 20 minutes, if that's what you're looking for, and that's, that's what we're gonna uh, model in the beginning, so. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we, are, we are also um, in a conversation right now internally looking at federal grant opportunities to advance the preliminary engineering and environmental work for, this is not exactly your question, but to complete the double tracking on TRE. So there's, there's lots of, um, there's lots of distance between us and, and trains running at higher frequencies, and so we're gonna be doing the due diligence now to get ready to, to do those projects if and when funding becomes available. So how many miles of lift do we have to double track? About nine, nine and a half miles of, of double track remaining. On, on TRE, and then of yeah. course, text <coughs> another question. Yes, sir. Okay, Wayne. It is hard to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first, as I always say, All right? All right. Good afternoon, board members, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I'm here to give the operations report. I tend to like to do this once a quarter. We have some new members to the board, so I wanted to run through it so that you understand what we're looking at and maybe where, what we'll see uh, in changes as the year goes on and we run into a new fiscal year as well. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going to start and remind everybody, these reports can be found on Trinity Metro website under the key performance indicators section. It's at the bottom, take a look, you can get on it. It's refreshed with March numbers now. I have February number years, numbers here for you, but it is refreshed up and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a highlight of what March looked like as well. But we'll start with on-time performance fixed route and you're probably all sitting there going, well, well Wayne, it's below the goal and it has been really much of the year. If you recall, two things are going on here. We, we tightened up the standards. So we went from 10 minutes being on time uh, to eight minutes. So 20% improvement. So numbers are lower, yes. We were making this a stretch goal. We are moving up uh, that ladder towards 91% right now. As of April, we're even closer to the 91% goal. One of the other things that have been going on in, in the operations is, as we all know, downtown's been shut down and detoured and moved all around. Well, our buses have to get, navigate that, and the majority of our buses go through the downtown area. So we're, we're keeping a close eye on it. Our ultimate goal is to get to a window of minus one in five minutes. Uh, we do this incrementally over the years. 
but, but that's what we should be looking towards uh, uh, as our final goal is one in five, and, and we'll make that happen. So we're pleased with the results so far. I'm going to go to the next page, and that is uh, miles between road calls. So again, you could say, oh, you're not meeting the goal, and we aren't. We've, we stretched it. The fleet got older. We haven't purchased a new fixed route bus in over three years. I went back to look at all the road calls and what they were. They were the 10- and 11-year-old buses. Uh, those are the ones that are going to be replaced here uh, after our next order. Our next order will be shortly, and uh, so that it comes in 12 months from the time we place that order. Uh, so we're doing good. The buses that are younger are, are performing exactly ha as you would expect them. In, in other words, reaching that goal. It's the 10- and 11-year-old buses that are not. 80% of the calls were 10 or 11 year old bus fleet that we retire them at 12, just so you have an idea, okay? Oops, sorry. Uh, preventable collisions, doing well here. Lower is better, so everybody knows. So if you're below the line or, or the goal of 1.2, you're, you're exceeding your performance goal. They're doing excellent, as you can see. We're rivaling last year's. If you recall, when we gave the, re the end of the year report last year, we were doing significantly better than any other year since I've been with the organization, and we'll continue that trend. On the next page, page 15, uh, talk about safety events, and you might be going, what exactly is a safety event? Those are the major collisions that we report to FT the FTA during the reporting periods. We're doing well here. We're exceeding goal. Again, remember, lower is better. The next one is fixed route on page 16. Fixed route, non-preventable collisions. There is no goal for non-preventable collisions because that's the public hitting our vehicles. But you can see the results, what's going on in the uh, community. And, and well, they're performing better. So they're not hitting us as, as much. <laughs> Next page on page 17 is access in-house. We do separate, for the new board members, we do separate access paratransit services. One is in-house because we handle it with our internal uh, operators and vehicles. The other is a contracted service with Yellow Cab. Yellow Cab does 60% of the business, whereas Trinity Metro employees do 40% of that business, roughly. Uh, so everybody's performing well on access in-house, and you'll see the same with the contractor. They're, they're, they're beating goal, doing quite well. And, and actually, ridership has been increasing, and we're well past the, the numbers that they were performing prior to COVID, so they're doing quite well. Turning to the next page, page 18, miles between road call. This fleet is very old. We actually had a procurement. We'll be coming next month for you to talk to you about new fleet for the whole on-demand program. Uh, so we have come to a conclusion what we believe is a, a right purchase for this fleet. And, uh, and so we'll come next month. But these, all these buses that we're, we're looking at are over seven years and many more miles than needed. So they do cause additional road calls, nothing major. But, and you can see on-time performance is doing well. So it's not being affected, but it is, it is a, we want a, a newer fleet and we need to replace it. We'll be coming next month with that. Turning to the next page, page 19, the access in-house preventable collisions, beating goal again, lower is better. Uh, very proud of the team. We're doing really, really well. Uh, the safety events, same thing. These are the major collisions where it usually costs you more money because there's usually medical involved. You can see there's zero across the board. That, great numbers for the, for the team. Turning to the next page, page 21. You can see access in-house non-preventables, and uh, public's doing well there as well. Turning to the next page, page 22, we see access contract. It's a repeat in rents. It's 93% on time. They're really doing quite well. So Yellow Cab, as our contractors, is performing. Uh, access contract miles between road calls. You can see their numbers are, are very large, and you're probably going, well, why are they so much higher than an access cutaway vehicle? These are vans, and they actually have a very new fleet. They've kept up with the contract obligations and continue rotating fleet through, and you can see the results uh, doing quite well. Very few breakdowns, and they're performing 60% of the business. Turning to the next page, page 24. Preventable collisions, you can see, again, they're doing well, meeting their goal. Uh, and so 
good job for the yellow cab folks. And then access safety events, again, these are ones that would cost additional monies to them. They have uh, zeros other than they had one in February. So they're meeting goal and, and, and really exceeding all expectations. Okay, so last but not least, we, we're gonna get into the system ridership. Uh, now this is February numbers. I do have a bit of an update for you in March. But they, they're, you could see we were at 602,000 versus 470,000 or 28% higher in February. It was due to the weather events that took place in the prior winter, and that's why we were so much higher. Uh, in, in March, they performed 631,000 rides, or 7.53% higher than the previous March. So we're continuing the trend, just not at the high rate, in the high rate in February is due to the weather event. All right, so get the fixed route bus uh, ridership, monthly ridership. Same thing there. Again, the weather contributed to the large increase month over month from 364,000 from 274,000 rides, 32% 30, higher. But in March, we had 363,000 rides, or 6.78% higher than previous year. So good, good results again. A ridership continues to grow, and uh, the team is doing well. Next one, access combined. And, and really what's an important story here, we've talked about access and on-demand services and we're gonna move both of those uh, systems into one system for the agency and we're gonna call, call it Trinity Metro On Demand. They had 27,000 rides, uh, 26,000 in February, 27,000 rides in March. If you flip to the next page, uh, page 29, you can see Zip Zone, another on-demand service. Oops, I went one too far. Another on-demand service, and in, in uh, February they had 27,000 rides. You could see that significantly increased over prior year of 11,418. In March they had 27,000 rides for a zip zone at, versus 13,000. Again, 98% higher than previous year. Fantastic results. If you take the two combined, because that's what, how we'll report them later on in October when we start moving forward with the new contract you'll see that rivaling uh, Reed's Texrail uh, ridership. So we'll be fighting between third and fourth place there, Reed. <laughs> oh, always, always, hey, we're always in competition. <laughs> there you go, Reed. So, no, very proud of the results. We, we are at 3.3 rides per hour on on-demand. Our goal early on, and Jeff, you, you would know this more than anybody, when we first started talking about this, we wanted to be at 3.5 or around 3.5 rides per hour. And quite frankly, uh, when we first started, we were slightly under one, and, and we started growing, and we were, we were elated at one and a half rides per hour. But that, you, you can't even speak to it, but 3.3 is just absolutely fantastic. We want to continue that as we merge the two service lines. They'll, they'll hopefully rival what I would want them to be, four to five passengers per hour. And I would say that would be one of the best operations in North America. And I'm speaking out of turn maybe on saying it that way, but. Four would be absolutely the best in, the, in America. Yep, I, I, I think so. So we're gonna, we're gonna, I believe, touch that. I mean, do you need to be better than Reed? <laughs> <laughs> A lot more. <laughs> Well, we had to have some competition, Reed. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's really the end of the presentation. I wanted to just run it, run through it with you. Uh, uh, maybe next, in October, we'll say, see TexRail, oh, we'll see On Demand right, right above TexRail, so. <laughs> Anyways, uh, if you have any questions, glad to uh, answer them. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is probably both a Wayne and Reed question. Well, we spent the last two years talking about COVID recovery and like ridership recovery, but I'm curious now, when we look at our current ridership, we, don't, we only go back to 2021, 2020. What about, where are we relative to pre-COVID ridership on like well, Texrail and this it's, route? It's not really a fair comparison because we started in 2019 with low, on well, Texrail, if we're gonna look at both of them, but um, of course, we did dip down during COVID, but we're over 140, 50% recovered on 
tax row. We're, we're well above where we were pre-COVID yeah. on tax row. Because it's, it's a newer service, it was a newer, right? Yeah. It's catching on. Ch Chad probably has a top of his brain because he was following all these numbers. I think we surpassed uh, COVID numbers. So we're, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're exceeding pre-COVID levels in the aggregate. Right. There's changes by route in part of the city. And what the industry has now done in this last six months is pivot from a discussion about pre-COVID versus post-COVID to a, a conversation about the long range um, because what's happened is work life patterns have changed, commute patterns, four day work weeks, four day school weeks. I mean, there's so many changes that have occurred that it's, it's no longer really a, a fair comparison. Yeah. Okay. But the good news is that in total, we're exceeding pre-COVID levels. Right. And then I have another question about, um, so, and I would imagine the same, it's the same answer that Reed just gave about TexRail, like this massive growth in zip zone, that's because we've added so many new routes, so many, we've added so many new zip zones relative so to prior years. So last year we didn't add any, anything. We just, yeah, it just, these well, we just add it, it, we've been doing it for probably 12 months now. So, so, and, and really ridership isn't, that's not where we're having strong ridership growth at, but we did add uh, Forest Hill to that, that zone this past year. So, so, but it, it's doing well. It's doing like the rest of, of the zones when you start them, start off sl slow and gradually grows and it's continued to grow. So we're, we're all excited about that. The largest zip zone is the near south side zip zone, by far and away the busiest. The next largest uh, and, and rivals south side is the Alliance area. And it is, they're, they're neck and neck month to month on who's providing the most rides. And they're both about 1,100, 1,200, and we'll touch 1,400 rides per, per week in, in those zones. So uh, they're, they're really the two busiest. And then Mercantile, which was our original, uh, is a steady, steady uh, zip zone that performs well. And, uh, but we have some others that we're looking at that Chad will talk about later on at some point in time, so. Thank you. So, Wayne, can you give us a ballpark given the increase in ridership? Is that lowering our cost per ride? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're below $40 a, a ride on on-demand on services. Uh, Paratrans is still a little, is closer to touch of 60. So the combination of the two should should provide some ability to actually grow to four to four and a half rides per hour, which will help with that overall cost per ride. Did you say 30 or 40? Slightly below 40. Um, yeah, I just, well, now that we've gone through the whole COVID, post-COVID world, in this post-COVID world, just looking at your numbers from 2021 to where they are now, it's significant, so it's a big story, so. Yeah. Keep it up. It is a, it's a huge story, and, and we're just to the point where since we're beyond it, we're, we're looking to the future and what we can do to improve services across the uh, spectrum so that we can get more ridership. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Sure thing. I can give you an update and uh, uh, a little education on how Zip Zone works and, and all that. Yeah. Yep. So. Good afternoon, everyone, and. I know I wasn't asked this question directly, but still at a national level, and according to APTA, most other agencies are still only reporting out at 70 to 80% recovered. So in comparison, Trinity Metro, Reed's team, Wayne's team, we're, we're doing really excellent. So I know not directed at me, but I thought worth, worth talking about. And, and to be clear, it was Reed's team that's better? Than <laughs> There you go. 
All right, so in your packets on pages 32 through 43 is our report on our transit initiative strategic communications and community engagement activities. And this is covering activities over the last three months. Um, so just program background a little bit um, on that first page of the report. RFP 23T054 was posted late last summer and that resulted in the board approval of BA 2024-04 and that was for transit initiative communications and public relations. Um, it resulted in a contract with Public Information Associates and Dickey and Associates. So just as a special note before we get into the nuts and bolts of things, um, Heather Dickey from Dickey and Associates is with us today. She's right over there. She's been working very closely with us over, over the last several months. Um, not here today, but certainly working on something on behalf of Trinity Metro um, is Lee Hornsby from Public Information and Associates. So even though she's not here, I'm convinced that she's probably doing something Trinity Metro related. All right, so on the, the next page, really kind of getting things started, our work began in January. Um, we've had a lot of staff support on kicking, the, kicking this project off. And I just want to shout out to everybody who's kind of helped us along the way. So Dietra and her team have been heavily involved. Of course, Chad and his team have been involved in this project. Um, Rebecca Montgomery, Laura Hanna, and many others have really been at the, the table to, to get us going and, and down the right path of everything that we've needed to do. Um, really, we talked about what opportunities we should prioritize, what we needed, understanding our program, um, and, and really coming up with the idea that ultimately what we're all here to do is build support for Trinity Metro and, and do that to ensure that our communities embrace our value and the service that we offer to better position us for when we need to seek additional investment for future growth. So on page 36, you can see the first set of goals that we identified. Um, pretty straightforward to build awareness, build loyalty, and build advocacy. Um, specific tasks supporting those goals are shared on the next page, page 37, and then outlined in the following pages. So I want to just do some, some highlights of the things that I think are really exciting that we've been working on. Um, first and foremost, in partnership with the planning department, Heather and Lee and their groups really helped engage our community around public meetings that we just held for the last several weeks. Uh, they were out on the streets, they were making phone calls, they were flyering or canvassing with flyers, knocking on doors. Um, really, I mean, they literally went door to door in the geographical areas in which we were holding public meetings. So. On the heels of that, we're currently planning many upcoming what we're calling community meetings beginning in June. Um, there'll also be some in August. These will be town hall type meetings, all, all geared towards educating the community, engaging the community, and informing, and informing our community. Um, so, so what does this all mean? You hear strategic communications, right? Well, we have to kind of sit down with our customers and our community to understand what the opportunities are, right? So, so these meetings that we're doing will, will further help us develop our audience profiles um, and to build out our draft communications plan. We already have the draft plan, but we need to really hone in on our key messages and our channels to help do those, th do those three things, right? Build awareness, loyalty, and advocacy. So as I just mentioned, we do have draft plans for both our strategic communications plan and our public engagement plan. These plans identify things like community meeting cadences, um, outreach activities, the start of target audiences, and the start of key messages. And those things are just going to continue to evolve as we get further into it. So also as of note, outlined in task four and highlighted on page 40, public information and associates and Dickey and associates have coordinated with us to build out a pretty comprehensive database for community outreach, which includes to date nearly 150 events and organizations. And those are all groups that are gonna hear from us as we go through this process. So they will be back out on the streets with the flyers, with the phone calls for everybody that they've identified in this database. That's just getting started, right? It's, it's still working. There are several areas that we're still working on building that out with their help. So, and I guess just to put it into perspective with our recent public <clears throat> meetings, their group distributed roughly 1,200 flyers personally to the groups in that database, which is, I mean, that's a ton of effort. Um, I personally was pleased to fee see a few new faces at our public meetings, and we know that will just continue. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, as of March 25th, we've launched an engagement hub. So that is accessible through the Trinity Metro website. There's all sorts of stuff on it right now. Um, users can find the latest on our upcoming meetings, share their ideas, share their con concerns, share their stories, right? There's a section to share your stories opportunities to meet key frontline staff, um, really open up a, a two-way communication with us in a digital way that, that we didn't have before. So those are the highlights. A lot has been done and going on since the beginning of the year. We're just gonna get busier and busier, so we'll continue to bring these updates to the board of directors. Um, when we have our activities for June outlined, I'd like to bring them back to the group, and of course, we would love to have our, our board members participate in those. Um, so that concludes my report. If there are any questions of either myself or Heather. Okay, all right. Well, so for the next report, we're gonna talk about paid advertising and we're gonna have Glenn Miller, Director of Marketing, review that with you. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, here we go, good. I wanna clarify first too that this is our paid advertising campaign for March. It does not include any organic social media or um, anything in-house, basically. I'm going to start with um, our continued celebration of our 40th anniversary. In March, we celebrated um, off by offering a 40% discount on a 31-day pass um, through social media. We updated the video that we had launched in November with the, the, the uh, anniversary was first held. Uh, all of these assets were, were translated into Spanish for placement on Telemundo and connected TV, as well as digital ad displays. We'll go ahead and... Oops, get that video right. Just a lot of fun there. So um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the GoPass promo code was redeemed 219 times in March for that sale. Um, next, we, do some, we did some advertising in the Fort Worth Weekly, just some general ridership campaign. This, for those of you that don't know or need a refresher, is part of our TM campaign, which was launched a few years ago to help with brand awareness, uh, improving brand awareness, and that we use the TM alliteration for types of people who utilize our systems. In this case, it's a time-saving multitasker, loves Trinity Metro. Also in March, we uh, took advantage of spring break, spring break travel, particularly air travel, to showcase Texrail. We had airport terminal ads, these large diesel displays with, throughout all four, uh, five terminals of uh, DFW Airport, as well as a promotional email and paid social media through Culture Map that hyped using Texrail, took, or promoted the, the affordability of the ride of just $2.50 to get you all the way from the airport to any destination along the route to downtown Fort Worth. Um, in addition, we did provided some just general awareness again of Texrail through Culture Map, Daily Digest emails on their website, utilizing other executions of our TM campaign, in this case, the Toned Muscle Men and the Tattooed Meditators. I thought that was Wayne at first. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> so skipped ahead there. Um, also, spring break, major travel to uh, two of the city's highest or most popular destinations, the zoo and the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. We showcased the south side zip zone to get, to get uh, visitors to those locations. And again, we created custom TM campaigns with tickling monarchs and tortoise meetups. And these were uh, utilized uh, through social media as well. We created a custom landing page on our site. They gave all the details and links to each of those destinations to ensure that people had all the information they needed to uh, get, make that happen. And then the Southside Zip Zone had an 87% year-over-year increase during the week of spring break during this campaign. So very impressive. What's going on here? Uh, we did, some, again, some general awareness of ZipZone uh, through a print and digital campaign, primarily with the Fort Worth Weekly, more of our TM campaign. And ZipZone ridership in March had a year-over-year -year increase of 98%, as Wayne stated earlier. 
Uh, this actually should say the southeast zip zone. Uh, again, this was showcasing Forest Hills, ex our expansion into Forest Hill. We're still tagging that to make sure that those residents are aware of it. Um, there's just more zip zone to love, and this was all handled through paid social media, and the agency reserves uh, at least a partial reimbursement for some of those um, advertising efforts. This zone, uh, year over year, had an increase in ridership of nearly 35% which is good for, the, as this is one of our um, least traveled zones, but it's growing. GoPass, we continue to promote GoPass and use of that mobile app for ticketing, tracking, buying tickets, tracking rides, uh, reloading your, your value on tickets, and then also I'm missing one, um, planning trips. So uh, there's writing. <laughs> Perfect. And this, this was uh, placed on paid social media as well as streaming and pre-roll video services. Also translated in Spanish for use on Telemundo. Uh, and a couple impressive uh, results about GoPass. The number of downloads in March increased 40% over the previous uh, time period last year. And the sales volume increased 17% from March of 2023. Finally, uh, TCC advertising, like we're, we do everything we can to get uh, those students on board our equipment, uh, trains, buses, zip zone vans, everything. Uh, so we did some advertising within the Collegian, which is the TCC newspaper. We did some print as well as some website advertising in their pop-ups. This uh, TCC ridership increased 26% year over year uh, from 2023, so I believe that uh, we're hitting people in the right places or, or getting our message is, is getting, getting where it needs to be and um, motivating those rides. And that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? No, but I was at um, the Open Streets thing on Magnolia and my kids were having a meltdown, but y'all were doing a great job as I was strolling by with the Excellent. screaming tops. <laughs> we had many people playing cornhole and one of our operator's wives was the best at carnival barking, getting people to come over and, and hear about our services. So it, it was a good time. Thank you so much. In, in the interest of, of the uh, Reed Wayne thing, can you tell the board who beat you at cornhole at the uh, Metro Blue? I believe something? it was someone named Ben. <laughs> yeah. The board is well represented. <laughs> <laughs> he won fair and square. Very good. Thank you so much. Oh, Tio. Um, Melissa or, or Glenn, where are we on releasing the names of our Textrail train sets? I was on the platform the other day. I had a couple kids again say. Yes. We, we have them all secured. Now it's a matter of getting the designs finalized and then the notifying ball? the winners and then getting those uh, placed on the trains. Uh, we're anticipating an, an early to mid-May release of all of that. Okay. So it's not been forgotten. All right, thank you. I knew it was. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, thank you. Hello. So in your packet, my community engagement report begins on page 57. So for the new board members, my report consists of customer care call center stats, complaints or concerns or accommodations from our customers that we receive, and also occasionally someone from my team will do a report on outcomes of our employee and community events and also talk about the upcoming events that you're all welcome to attend. So moving on page 58, our customer care call center we receive an upwards of 20,000 calls per month. We do strive to answer our customers as quickly as possible uh, with not ha without having customers wait on hold for too long. We measure the hold times in minutes. So our goal is 1.5 minutes that a customer should be on hold, and we're gonna improve that in the coming months. On the graph, I just wanna explain to you a little bit, uh, the yellow indicates needs improvement. The white is that we're doing okay, but we can do better. And then the blue is exceeding expectations. So for the month of March, our whole time came in at 2.9 minutes. During March, we had one less customer care rep, and we also wanted to factor in spring break. 
So spring break when kids are out, families are using transit, as you can hear, you've heard about the ridership we've had. So the call volume increased. Although the team improved month over month, we strive to um, get to our goal uh, much quicker. So we're gonna do some additional training for our staff in the coming weeks to improve our outcomes for our customers and also the processes in customer care. Looking on page 59, we report valid complaints by mode, and currently we have fixed route and access services. We report access per 1,000 boardings, and we are down month over month, but still fall in the needs improvement category. The complaints rose to the top were uh, passenger safety, operator late, and ride arounds. So for quarter three, Ferry Bright, our quality review manager, She's gonna start working with Access Team to really create a campaign to fully focus on passenger safety. As safety is one of our values, we will also be working with our training team to make available additional training for our Access operators. So by the end of the quarter, we expect to see this fall off the list and also our complaints to decrease. Turning your attention to the fixed route graph, we measure this by 100,000 boardings per 100,000 boardings. I expect to see the number go down in this as well, the working with our ops team and the installation of our new shelters that, were, that will really create a clear visibility uh, for our operators to see our customers. And by us speaking with our customers to really explain the rules of riding transit, which we have already started to do. So you can see the missed trips, late pass-bys. Pass-bys could be a customer not really at the bus stop, but, they're, but they say they're at the bus stop, and we are trained to actually stop when a customer is at the bus stop. So communicating that with our customers really helps to um, decrease that de complaint. And Mr. Chairman, board, that is my report. And if you have no questions, I will introduce Ms. Lenore Kimbrough. I have a quick question, just because this is a bit out of our other areas of expertise. From the board side, what other things can we be doing to support the call center, the, the reps, the process? Are we doing everything we can? Are there other needs that other agencies are doing that we could do differently? Just, it's easy to say we need more trains and buses, but from the call center side, that's a different different world. I really appreciate that um, question. You all are doing everything great. It's We want to internally work with our team to really help them understand the importance and have the expectations of serving our customers well. We serve our customers with, with the service that we're putting out, but when customers call, we're the first line of communication. So we want to make sure that we're working with our team. So we'll be really putting together some training modules for the customer reps to um, really be more focused on helping the customer, uh, solving issues, uh, and different things like that. But y'all are doing perfect. Awesome. Hey, Deidre, you forgot to mention your, um, your work location. My what? I'm sorry. Your new work location. Oh, <laughs> so I will be um, spending a lot of time over at HRP uh, where the call center is. So I will have an, a satellite office over there to really sit down and uh, shadow the reps to really see what they do because it's easy to say or to comment, but if you don't really know or by walking a mile in someone's shoes what they're going through, it's it's minute, so I will be over there um, three to four days a week. So I have two offices now. <laughs> nice. So I got a question in regards to the safety. Is it safety of the vehicle itself or something like driving of the, uh, of the operation of a vehicle? What are the safety issues for access? Well, making sure that the passenger is um, wheelchair in a wheelchair, making sure they are strapped in, I wouldn't say strapped in, secured uh, much securely uh, before the vehicle leaves. Yes, just making those little, those little changes and reminders. <laughs> All right, so I would like to introduce Ms. Lenora Kimbrough. She is our community engagement program manager, and she will talk about the envoys, what they're doing, and what we're doing in the community. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dietra, for the introduction. Good afternoon, board. As mentioned, I am Lenore Kimbrough. I am the Community Engagement Programs Manager here at Trinity Metro, and I am responsible for the team of envoys, as well as events related to the community for, for the community and for our employees. 
I would like to take a moment and share with you some great things that we are doing within the community here in the second quarter. In the second quarter of 2024, the Transit Envoys have connected with over 28,000 customers. The a customer contact is as simple as a customer or a passenger asking an envoy what bus they catch at Fort Worth Central Station. So where do I catch the 15 and the envoy will direct them to where they need to go or they will walk them to that location. It is also the envoys being on the bus with the passengers, engaging with the passengers, explaining the services to them and engaging with the operators as well. We have had 34 special events and career days and counting so far. So a special event is something, is a Transit 101. A Transit 101 is me and Dietra. We have been to TCC South and we've engaged with the students and the staff there, letting them know about our programs with Trinity Metro Easy Ride programs and letting them know that we are a partner with them and that we can help them and train them in any way that they need so that they are utilizing transit services. We have also established a relationship with True Worth Place, which is a comprehensive resource center and day shelter for our community. We visit them every fourth Friday, and we share with them how to navigate our system in our community and the rules of riding transit. We are meeting our customers where they are, so we go to them and we speak to them so that they are comfortable. Out of those 34 special events, 12 have been career days. We have six more to go. It's been a long haul. <laughs> we go out, visit the classrooms, and share with the kiddos just how cool transit is. We, you will see on the next slide one of our junior envoys in the making, getting them excited about riding transit at a young age and building confidence up in our future riders is very important. Next, the envoy team has completed 39 ride-alongs. When an envoy team is out individually, riding, or at a transfer center, sometimes they encounter passengers that are a little bit lost or confused about how to get to their destination. That's when one of our envoy team members will hop on the bus with them and get them to their final destination. If that's going from Central Station to La Grande Plaza, if that's going from Sierra Vista to TCC, they will ride along with them and make sure that they get there confidently and that they feel safe and secure. So it's like an impromptu travel training. And last, we have had 14 travel trainings. These are pre-scheduled travel trainings. So organizations such as Catholic Charities or the individuals that they have made contact with throughout the quarter or throughout the year, they will contact myself or sometimes Ms. Dietra. They will contact the envoys because they have business cards as well that they hand out. And they will write up a itinerary for them. So we get them from place to place. We meet them at the nearest bus stop to their home and we take them from home to work, work to the grocery store, to a clinic, back to home so that they know how to ride the bus, how to get there and how to get home and it's a free service. Here are a few pictures of the events that we have um, been to this year so far. The team was invited to Destination Grapevine where they got to meet like-minded individuals in the community and network with people in their same field. That was a great outing for them to do. That is our junior envoy at Atwood Elementary. So he got to dress up and the envoys got to dress him up and show them exactly what they wear and all the tools that they carry along with them for the day. The backpack, the schedules, everything. Um, and then this is our flyer with True Worth Place that we visit them every single fourth Friday. I would like to take a moment to also introduce our envoys. They are here with me today. We have Mia Avelia, Rudy, please stand up, <laughs> Jamie, and Miss uh, Juanita, she's absent. We have two volunteer envoys, Margarita, she's here as well, and Christopher Terry, he is absent. One more thing before I go, we are also hosting some pop-up events. So those pop-up events are gonna be held at transit centers, bus stops, um, within the community. We've hosted our first one on April 2nd at Dennis Duncan Transfer Center. And so they're in the community, engaging with our passengers, giving them passengers, giving them schedules and helping them to route, um, route throughout the community and navigate the system and just for us to be present to let them know that we are there to help them and to service them. Thank you, that is my report. Any questions? What's the process for, for 
people, uh, people becoming uh, volunteer envoys, and is there a path for maybe newest board members sitting to my right to kind of <laughs> shadow an envoy for a little bit and, and learn more? To. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about that process? So you can get online. <laughs> the formal process is to get online on the Trinity Metro website, go to learn more, and if you scroll down to envoys, you click on there, and there's a link to the application. And board members should just come. But you could probably just call me or Dietra. Yeah. I'll call Dietra. Okay. Does he get a junior envoy? Up He's going to get I the whole I do need the whole up. outfit the, and the all the maps outfit. and the hat. And yes. I get to take the hat home, right? Yes. Okay. Everything. We're going to load you up. I did it for a day. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. No, I'll let uh, Greg do the finances. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. Um, my report is much shorter this month than it was last month, so uh, I'm sure everyone um, is very happy about that. Uh, I do have three items uh, that I want to share with you. Um, the general planning consultant uh, update is on page 64. Uh, and then the table of all the task orders that we currently have is on page 65. Uh, so a couple items out of this that you'll hear more about at the, uh, the board retreat uh, that's scheduled soon is the tr transit value proposition and then assessing community interest in transit. Both of those, I'll give you updates on that and, and go into some detail about uh, what we have found out uh, at the board retreat. Uh, I did also wanted to mention uh, on uh, task item eight, grant writing, uh, it identifies there the uh, application for the FTA bus and bus facilities grant. Uh, we're working on that for our mobility hubs for the Alliance corridor. But as Rich mentioned earlier, we're also looking at a Chrissy grant, uh, which would be for the, the planning activities for TRE double tracking the entire uh, corridor in Tarrant County. Uh, and then um, lastly on the GPC update is the uh, task order number nine, which is the text row before and after study. We've spent a lot of time working with FTA and the North Central Texas Council of Governments on preparing a, a before and after study that's required through the full funding grant agreement that we received for the, the federal dollars for TexRail. Uh, we've shared that with FTA and I got a thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take that uh, as of now as we're done, but I've not heard the uh, final report on that. So um, hopefully we are wrapped up with the before and after so that uh, Richie and others can move on to more um, important and pressing items. Um, next, I just wanted to highlight the uh, public meetings. We did have public meetings. I shared with you last month at the board meeting the fair changes that we're planning and the, um, um, the uh, service changes as well. And so we had public meetings on that. We had probably I don't know, 25 to 30 people collectively show up at the four different meetings. Um, uh, Melissa went through and uh, identified the, uh, the training metro ride, training metro slash engage, uh, community engagement uh, website that uh, provides uh, the presentation for the public meeting plus some other information and opportunities for actually engaging in that. Without a whole bunch of advertising, uh, other than at the public meetings, we have about 150 people who have engaged the website uh, through the QR code that we provided at the, at the meetings. And then we received about 25 uh, emails and website inquiries. So uh, it's, it started out slow, obviously, because we haven't done the, the, uh, the full-blown marketing um, just yet, which is, I think, a good testament now as we're moving forward that people will, will engage in this. The last item I have is kind of a, a disappointing item um, that I have to share with you. We spent a lot of time uh, working on an RFP for the property at TNP over at Vickery, uh, working um, with the, the developer who had uh, submitted the winning RFP 
trying to work through that to get you know ground lease versus a, a property sale. Uh, finally got to the point that yes, we're gonna sign a, a, a property sales agreement. Uh, and unfortunately last week we came to a, a point where we could not move forward. And so the, uh, the development group Seiko had chose to um, cancel the, their uh, uh, property sales agreement uh, on their end. Um, both of us were disappointed. It just came to a point to where, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't negotiate out of, of this particular element. So uh, disappointing, so that project has, has stopped. And so we're gonna kind of recuperate and uh, reset uh, a little bit so that we can figure out what we need to do with that uh, property in the future um, um, so that we can hopefully uh, get it back on the market in several months so that we can uh, get it developed ultimately. Uh, it'd be a great benefit for the near south side and us at uh, TMP to have some sort of retail uh, and residential in that particular area. So a little disappointed, you can tell my, my voice, but uh, it's one of those things that uh, as they tell me, Greg, Greg tells me this is just it's kind of how it happens sometimes, you know, projects fall through. It means so. something better is coming. Yes, that's what I'm hoping is. I'm a half glass half full type of person, so I'm hoping that's the case. So anyway, any questions for me? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm Greg Jordan, the CFO. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to page 67 for the Feb February financial report. Okay, believe, beginning with revenue update, um, we're currently projecting revenues to exceed the budgeted amount by 3.2 million. Uh, total revenues are budgeted at 320.4. We're projecting 321.1 in revenue. Um, this is primarily driven by some of the grant activity as well as the overperformance of sales tax from Grapevine. Um, on the expense side, we have total operating budget of 154.7 million, and we're projecting 152.1 million or 2.5 million below budget. Fixed route activity, uh, year to date, we've currently spent 18.5 million. By this time last year, we spent 16.4 million. Um, we're currently projecting about a 900 or about a $90,000 overage. This is primarily driven by uh, personnel costs. Uh, yet we are still projecting savings in other areas such as purchase transportation, fuel, and uh, vehicle supplies. Moving on to access, uh, we're trending slightly above budget by about 400,000. This is primarily in personnel. Um, and the access budget is 1.8 million. We're currently projecting about 12.2 million in total spend. TRE year to date is 7.2. We spent 6.4 million during the same time, time period last year. Um, and we ended the year at uh, um, 17.2 versus a total budget of 17.3. We currently have a favorable uh, projected position of $100,000 at the end of the year. Tax trail year to date, 11.6 million compared to 10.6 million the same time period last year. We're projected to end the year at 30.3 million with savings of 1.1. Last year's total spend by comparison was 28.5 million. Bike share, slight savings projected at 5,000. Uh, we're very much in line with last year's total performance and projecting $813,000 total spend against a budget of $819,000. Finally, on the general and administrative side, uh, total budget of uh, 49.6. We're on pace to spend $47.7 million or year, in the year favorable by 1.8 million. So just to wrap it all up, we're anticipating a favorable position at year end by about 3.2 million. Our current cash flow remains adequate to meet all of our operating and capital needs. From a cash and investment basis, we currently have about 55.6 million in unrestricted funds. With that, I'll answer any questions the board may have. Where you go, Greg? Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. On page 69, uh, there's a resolution that we're seeking your approval for. Um, this is to expand the, the agency's investments so that we can participate in um, Logic, which is a pool investment trust for governmental agencies. Um, by virtue of, of expanding that, we get to increase the diversification of our, our investments, um, as well as having other opportunities. We look for additional yield. Um, Tex Pool is uh, it's it's one of about half a dozen um, pools out there, very strong in, in its overall performance. I'd recommend that the board approve. Any questions? I'll accept the motion. Do we have a motion? Opposed? Thank you. Very it passes. So to our action item, Bruce. Good afternoon, Bruce Lewis. I'm your Vice President of Technology. Uh, one thing we always try to do in technology is always strive to be better and better and make the systems better and more reliable. Uh, if you please go to page 72. Uh, the current phone system we have is a Mitel system. It is basically seven and a half years old and it's growing out of service and we no longer can find parts and pieces for it. Uh, this year we put in an infrastructure of a Cisco backbone with all our new switches and hardware is all Cisco. We're laying on top of that a new Cisco enterprise phone system which will do a lot of major things for us. It'll give us soft phones on our PCs. We'll get rid of a lot of the desk phones will go away. And it also will build the future for anything we want to go for the call centers and going forward into that and moving farther down the line. It'll be a, a mirror system as we stack the better products on top of each other. So our recommendation, the Training Metro Board of Directors authorizes the President and Chief Executive Officer to enter into a one-year contract with SHI International Corporation for a new Cisco Enterprise phone system for for no uh, for amount not to exceed two hundred and seventy three thousand dollars. Any questions? Any motion? Motion. Sorry, right. I, oh. I just had a a question about your reading of the resolution. Did you did you read the one year term? Is that one year term? Yes, sir. You said that one year term. Okay, I one year contract. I, I, I want to be sure that was correct and not a typo or something. You no, were sir. Actually, it's okay. the one-year contract for hardware, and then the rest of it goes into our operating budget. That's <coughs> right for that. Have a motion. Motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor of BA 2024-17 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Good afternoon. I'm here to present um, action item BA 2024-18. This is a bus stop real-time information displays. Back in October 2021, we came to the board uh, in a uh, partnership with the City of Fort Worth for $220,000 to put in digital display, real-time information display boards at, uh, at the bus stops. Uh, we ended up putting in 31 of those displays. We had planned for 41, costs went up, unfortunately, as, as they do. And so we were able to put in um, uh, a mix of 13-inch and 32-inch displays. So if you go over to Forward Central Station, you'll see four 32-inch real-time information displays that show when the next buses show up. Um, so it's, it's proved pretty helpful for riders in that area to see when those buses are uh, coming in and, uh, and what time and how much time they have to wait. So what we started thinking is that uh, when we started the bus stop improvement program, we wanted to add more of those real-time displays. And so we started doing that and um, realized that we should probably come back to the board and ask for a little more money to get that done. So uh, we plan to put in an additional 80 locations of the, uh, the smaller 13-inch displays at more bus stops across the system. So this is uh, funding for that particular effort. So in the recommendation is the Trinity Metro Board of Directors authorizes the President and Chief Executive Officer to amend uh, contract 21 TO32 with Connect Point Inc. to install additional real-time digital display screens at the cost of $700,000 $700, $500 plus 10% for a 10% contingency for the
for the total amount not to exceed $770,550. Question. Okay, so I was in New York City last week um, at Urban Land Institute, and as I was riding the subway system, it was definitely the most easiest to get around. Stations were the ones with the displays. On these displays, will they show the bus route, um, kind of where you're going, where the bus has been coming from, along with the time, or is it just the time? This is this is just the time at those particular bus stops. Okay. Well, It'll tell you how many minutes the next bus will be there. Uh, the next several buses, honestly, uh, in, in, in the next time frame there. Is there a way we can start displaying the routes and kind of what your next stops are going to be on that? Well, they're, they're static locations. Okay. So the, um, we can look into if there's any map options for those to show how far away the buses are other than time. I think that would be super helpful. So, okay. Uh, the folks, uh, Where we have wait, Wayne, could you go up to the podium? Yep. Thank you. you got to speak into the mic, Wayne. Oh, I thought I had a loud yeah, voice. Too, Wayne Gensler, uh, <laughs> CEO of Trinity Metro. <laughs> so where they have transfer stations, we do have multiple routes that are displayed. Yes. So they can, but Chaz, right, single bus stop, if it's that route just servicing it, it'll, it'll provide that route and, and the timing. But... A multiple transfer station has multiple routes. Excellent, thank you. That, that makes sense. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, what's the shelf life? Uh, well, if they're not hit with a baseball bat, um, probably <laughs> specific. There, there's probably four or five years. <coughs> Checkman's car for baseball. Um, bat. And we have so we have. Um, they're, they're somewhat delicate on their own, but we ended up purchasing the protective case for it as well. And so that gives it a little bit more lifespan on that. Um, so we'll, we'll have to uh, monitor these and see uh, how long they do last over time to see if this is the, the right path or not for us in the future to they're get really them. Important, you know, items, but boy, you know, if they don't work. That's right. That's right. It's important. So they all have Wi-Fi connect, you know, capability and connect to the to the system. So they get the updates from the vehicles. All of Wayne's buses have GPS Wi-Fi capability. So that's how we know where the buses are and how far off they were. If if we don't have that connection, that Wi-Fi connection, then the sign reverts back to a scheduled uh, uh, the set schedule there. Uh, otherwise, it'll be the real time. Mr. Chairman, on our bus stop campaign, uh, one of the goals was to minimize or eliminate the need for utility work. So uh, we are powering all these installations through solar. So we've got the solar lights at the bus stops. These are solar-powered signs. They're, they're monochromatic, so they're low energy, uh, black and white. They're not. Um, so Isaac, I'm not sure if, if the ones you're referring to in New York, are they full color displays inside the stations? They were pretty epic. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. I can. <laughs> and and we, should, we should be aiming for that kind of standard, certainly at like a Fort Worth Central Station where we've got mm -hmm. access to power and data. Yeah. Yep. Any more questions? Motion. Thank you. Approving 2024-18, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Agreed? Uh, good afternoon again. I'm Reed Lanham, Vice President Arell, Paul. Um, if you would please turn to page 74. I've got action item number BA 2024-19. The Texrail letter of guarantee for our fleet expansion. So in February, we came to you guys with the pre-engineering services agreement with Stadler. And this was to get the ball rolling and keep timelines in place for us getting those four new DMUs as quickly as possible. Um, Stadler has begun the process of deciding, picking and choosing what's been obsolete, going to vendors, seeing where we can get these additional parts from. So that work is progressing. Part of the pre-engineering services is um, ordering the car bodies as well and some longer lead item parts that are costly. Um, this 
uh, will be to help keep the order on time. And uh, this letter of guarantee is for up to $2 million. If for some unforeseen reason they had already purchased these parts and then we were not able to come to an agreement, uh, we would be on the hook for that $2 million only in that instance. So this recommendation is the Trinity Metro Board of Directors authorizes the President and Chief Executive Officer to issue a letter of guarantee to Stadler US for rail vehicle materials ordered during the pre-engineering phase of the Texrail Vehicle Fleet Expansion Project in an amount not to exceed $2 million. Can I get Greg Jordan to weigh in on this? I'm okay, I'm okay with this at, at topical value, but mm -hmm. you're the one that says all the pretty things about our dollars. Yes, sir. Greg Jordan, Chief Financial Officer. Um, it, you know, generally speaking, it, you all know my experience is, is mostly on the, the municipal side. <clears throat> on the transit side, um, I'm very comfortable with this given given the, the depth that they're going to have to go into and the investment that they're going to have to make on this. Also, given the fact that um, at this point I'm very comfortable in, in our ability to um, get the project to, to completion. And so because of that comfort, then I'm, I'm also comfortable with this as well. Perfect. So, yes, I don't have any issues with it. Thank you, sir. A motion. Second. Aye. Thank you so much. Uh, Rich, we have a president's report. Good day, everyone. Uh, earlier this month, Trinity Metro's executive leadership team traveled by Amtrak's Heartland Flyer to Oklahoma City to learn from our neighbors to the north. Our counterparts at Embark, the city's transit provider, gave us an inside look at their growth strategy and success stories. We rode their streetcar system and saw firsthand the impact it is having on Bricktown, a lively and bustling district. A cornerstone of the city strategy is to leverage transit to produce bigger, more impactful results for the community and to amplify the overall return on investment. The MAPS program, as it's called, is now in its fourth iteration. It's a voter-approved bond program that invests in libraries, convention centers, sports and entertainment venues, economic development projects, parks, and transit. The latest MAPS program is valued at $978 million, was approved by 71.7% .7 of voters. That's a staggeringly good endorsement of a program and strategy. And by the way, this MAPS program started in 1993, so to say that this approach has staying power is really an understatement. Um, on a related note, Mayor Matty Parker has announced a task force. This was reported, uh, Mayor announced this uh, last week at the Downtown Fort Worth Inc. event. Uh, a task force to look at tourism, economic development, and rail for Fort Worth. We know a few things to be true. Our city is the fastest growing city in America. Our very popular text rail service is leading the way in ridership and transit-oriented development. Thank you, Tito and Paul. Um, we are seeing tremendous interest in downtown living, along with new and proposed development at Panther Island and the Fort Worth Stockyards. Public transportation must play a larger role in our community if we were to realize our collective goals. The question of how much, how quickly, and the overall business case will be discussed by this new committee. And finally, our opening event for Trinity Lake Station was earlier this month. Uh, many of you were there that day. It was a picture-perfect day. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Gina Bivens was there, Tarrant County Commissioner Lisa Simmons, Fort Worth City Manager David Cook, NCT COG Director Michael Morris, Arlington Council Member Raul Gonzalez, uh, many others were there. And we were gratified by their strong show of support. The new station is another important step in building a modern, dynamic, and meaningful transit system for our fastest growing city. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that was a really impressive opening of, of Trinity Lakes, and um, Rich just talked about economic development, about Oklahoma City. Uh, who would have thought that they were the 30th largest city in the United States, now they're the 20th largest city in the United States, and they have an educational level ahead of Fort Worth's educational levels. So they're, they're uh, uh, folks on a mission, and their mayors uh, jointly have said, 
they're trying to build a culture in their community of of a place where they want their uh, sons and daughters and their sons and daughters to return to their community and, and not have to go elsewhere for what these younger people want for economic development. And the, I mentioned too, um, the first thing that Mayor Parker asked me uh, years ago was, what's the ROI on uh, transit? That's a great question for anybody that, that really understands or thinks they understand transit. and, and I talked about with her the, the, the five number, that for every dollar spent you get a five dollar return and sent her some data and I haven't heard back from her in, in the sense that she doesn't really understand. She's from Fort Worth, small town, doesn't really see and, and can't touch those benefits. But uh, even if that number is half of the five dollars, because in Fort Worth, in Fort Worth particularly, we don't have very much economic development uh, for transit oriented development. It's in North Richland Hills and in Grapevine. But if it's just half, that's a $380 million number every year. Uh, that's a big number for economic development. And Michael Morris said something I thought was uh, prescient, and he didn't go into detail, but he talked about really the importance of, of the farm and city um, a mantra that's a group out of Austin with Jay Crosley. It talks about the value of, of crashes, uh, economic loss because of the crashes and deaths, and there are 4,200 uh, fatality crashes in Texas every year uh, to the tune of $55 billion in economic damage. That's a billion dollars. So every, every time you have a crash, there's a, uh, um, when there's a death, there's that sadness um, that you can't describe, but there's also that economic loss. And we have 187 deaths in the city of Fort Worth last year. That's over $2 billion in economic loss. And if, if we would consider that in, in terms of of uh, the congestion that we have, the loss of two weeks every year, the air quality, we're in a non-attainment zone currently in uh, the North Texas region and we're gonna have to spend untold millions of dollars uh, to, be, to try and become um, um, uh, not an unattainment zone. Um, and if you think about it, the best way to do it is with transit. Um, it's really a, a magnificent way to, to build a community um, it, your ROI for transit with, with um, TOD, uh, we went to Kansas City and the, the Kansas City CEO there said it was between eight and 20 times the investment. So we know because we're in this culture that happens all over in, in Minneapolis. Uh, Rich just got a report from Minneapolis that $17 billion in, in economic development that would not otherwise have occurred but for public transportation. In Dallas, I, I got a hats off to Dallas and Dart and Jack Wierzynski and, and his transit-oriented development focus. They have over $17 billion in economic development that would not otherwise have occurred but for public transportation. So the, the, the proof is out there. Um, we just need to, to make a commitment as a community. And my apologies for continuing to talk about it but it's the real deal. And if we're ever gonna change the, the focus and the direction of Fort Worth and be competitive with these bigger cities, we need to do these kinds of things. And I hope that uh, the, the committee that the mayor is appointed in looking at uh, a rail, uh, which has incredible support from the community. Uh, the polling shows 77, 78% support uh, increased spending uh, for rail and public transportation in the last two polls by the Real Estate Council and by our own internal polling. So the will is there. Um, we, just, um, we just need to have this vision. It's the vision thing as they have in Grapevine. And Paul, you understand that more than anybody, and so do you, Tito. That's a comment. This will not be the last time you hear about economic development uh, <coughs> the data. I apologize for that, but I really need everybody to viscerally understand the importance of public transit for communities. So with that, um, we will adjourn to a executive session.